We got First Samuel. Chapter 12, please. How many of you had a nap this afternoon? How many of you are just a little dozy right now? All right, good. Because of you folks that raise your hand, we're going to stand up, all right? Let's all stand. We're going to read a little bit of Scripture, get your blood flowing a little bit. 1 Samuel chapter 12. I would love to read the entire chapter, but I'm not going to. I'm going to give you a few sentence summary in a minute. But I want you to look at verse 18 with me as I read. The Bible says, So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto, our, added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside... For then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he had done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in church tonight. We don't take it lightly. Lord, I know that we, we just, we're so human, we're so flesh, we're so frail. We don't even know what we need from the word of God tonight. I pray that you will clear our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll help us focus on only the Word of God. Help us forget about the cares and affairs of this world. Lord, I pray that you'll help us focus on you. And I do pray, Lord, that you'll bring us closer to you because of the Word of God tonight. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm, I'm not going to keep you a long time tonight. Probably by five after seven, I'll be done. Maybe eight after seven. So don't worry. <clears throat> so that you haven't heard me preach before and all that. But I'm going to not shortchange them. I'm going to give you good truth, okay? Let me give you a good phrase. It'll help you remember the sermon. Turn not aside after vain things. It's a verse I read in verse 21. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. You understand the definition of the word vain is useless, meaningless, not profitable. Okay, so uh, a popular hymn, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One come down. Everything you do for the Lord, you know, the Bible talks about doing things in the spirit. That means in the power of the Holy Spirit. That means not doing them in your flesh. That means even when you do good things, they need to be done with the power and the backing of the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the word of God is not going to return void. If somebody distributed the word of God and gave it and they were not right with God, the word of God is so powerful that it supersedes. I'll, I'll put it to you this way very bluntly. An unsaved person could win somebody to Christ if they had a New Testament. I know that from many people's testimonies where they won many people to Christ and they themselves were not born again. Why? Because that's how powerful the word of God is. But just imagine then if you do think serving the Lord and you have the power of the Holy Spirit, how much better it will be. You're speaking, you're talking, your action, your prayers. The Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So you can pray, but you're not going to get the same results. Like when you give the word of God, because it's the word of God that's doing the working. So let me tell you this. Would you rather take an ax and chop some wood and chop and chop and chop and use all your energy and not have any wood chopped? Or would you rather have a sharp ax head and every time you swung the ax, a piece of wood was split? Which would you rather do? How many of you rather have the wood split? Raise your hand. How many of you rather see no results? Raise your hand. Okay, no deaf or dumb people in the service tonight. That's good to know. And here's the thing. You have the opportunity to choose what you do, whether it is vain or not. We use the word vanity. Why use the word vanity? Somebody is vain in their looks, in their appearance. Why? Because it doesn't mean that much. 
You have vanity about something? You care what people think? Let me tell you something, not to be unkind. It doesn't matter what you look like. I'm not saying you shouldn't brush your teeth and comb your hair and, you know, clean the egg off your tie before you wear it to church again. I'm saying do what you can to look decent, especially when you come to church. But what you look like, what God made your face look like, etc., it's not the most important thing in your life. Okay, so you don't believe that. I'm going to have to go over that a little while. Okay. Vain. All is vain. All the people are vain tonight in service. Turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Verse 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. I want you to know tonight that you and I are God's people because God wanted you to be his people. Because God loved you so much, he knew we were sinners, he watched us fall, and he knew we were going to. He's God, remember? And he made a way for you to have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come to this earth and shed his blood willingly and get up out of the grave and raise again. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. You don't have to live worrying about things like that. There are things that are vain. Let me tell you some things, how to keep this from happening. Let me give you a real quick background for the story here. Two chapters ago, the Israelites have whined and complained, we want a king like the other nations. They had the prophet Samuel. God told them what to do through the prophets, but they did not have a king. They whined and gripe. We want a king like the other nations. God said, okay, 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 enough griping. And he had Samuel go in and anoint Saul to be their king. That's two chapters before this. So Saul is the king. He's doing things he's supposed to do for the first year. And then chapter 13, Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 are with Saul and Mishmash in Mount Bethel. And 7,000, excuse me, and 8,000, 1,000, 8,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah. Benjamin, the rest of the people, he sent every man to his tent. Jonathan smote the garrison. Who smote the garrison? Who? Jonathan. Of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, and that is back then the culture, that's the six o'clock news. Da -da 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 -da. Hear ye, hear ye. And Saul said, let the Hebrews hear, verse 4, And all Israel heard, saying, Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. Who smote the garrison? Nope. Last question. Quiz only had two questions. First, who smote the garrison? Jonathan. The Bible just said Jonathan smote the garrison. But Saul pipes up with the trumpets, gather a crowd. Here's the news. Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines. Saul took credit for something he did not do. Now, you know what about that? Let me describe that for you. That's a vain thing. Why would you do that? How many of you have any children? Are you proud when they do right? I have a son. He happens to be a Jonathan son. I was proud of him during his life, school, college. He did things right. You know, he, he, he gets a great report card. He's got all A's. That never happened, did it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It did. He got all A's. And I said, hey, look, Jonathan got all A's. Wow, that's wonderful. Then I called everybody. Guess what? Chris got all A's. <laughs> you see how ridiculous that is? That's vain. <laughs> that's pure vanity. That's the definition. And King Saul, who was already the king, he was already head and shoulders above everybody in Israel in every way. God had already chosen him. Samuel had anointed him to be the king for crying out loud. Everybody does what he says. He's the king. And then his son, he should be proud of. They're in two different places to fight the Philistines. And Jonathan destroys some of them. And instead of saying, wow, my son did a great job. He announces to everybody that he did it. Do you understand how vain that is? You know, you know what happens when you see something that's vain and vanity? You do what you just did. You all laughed. That's what people do to you when you're vain. Hello? When you're vain... Yeah, your vanity, people laugh. And guess what? God laughs. So real quickly, this chapter ahead of time, uh, they're talking about how they got the king, and we want this and that to happen, and, and they're trying to tell, verse 3 of chapter 12, Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, whose ass have I taken. He's saying, who have I defrauded? What have I done wrong? Samuel's talking. Everybody said nothing. 
He said, okay, then listen to me. The rest of the chapter, he says, the Lord sent these people. He sent them to you. On and on. Verse 14. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord God. Have you ever known anybody that quit serving God? I have a long list. I'm not depressed about it. I don't sit and pout about it, but I know a lot of people from the time I was in junior high in church in a Christian school till last week, people that did serve God, served Him for a long time maybe, and then turned to the left or the right. I had 187 people that graduated from my Bible college the same year I did in 1985. Two years later, about 12 of them weren't in church. Three of them were in jail. I looked up something for the preaching. That did discourage me <laughs> that time. Lots of other stories. Because people didn't stay doing right. See, here's the thing. God saved you. You're safe for all eternity. Because he's the one that saved you. He's the one that birthed you into a new family. Marvel not that is saying you must be born again. You are born a new person, just like you're born a human being. There will never be a time that I will not have ever been born Chris Stancil. No matter if I die before I get to the back door today, no matter what happens, no matter who changes your name in the court system, it doesn't matter. You will always have been born, just like when you're born into the family of God, you're always born in that family, and you can do nothing to be unborn. Amen. Now, you can do something to break the fellowship. You can do something to decide your testimony of being in that family. That's the part that you decide with the vanity. Am I going to make my life count for God? Do you ever think about what happens the last day when you get there and it's all done and everything flashes before your eyes before you go or you get to the Lord and you look at him in those eyes and you think, geez, and crackers, I should have served the Lord more. You know, my, <laughs> my jet ski collection really did not mean that much compared to me being faithful to church. Well, I feel like there's tumbleweeds blowing through the room right now yeah 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 i'm saying this world has nothing for you but god almighty has eternity for you and that's where your heart ought to be forget the vanity so here's samuel saying look i've not done anything to you and he says in verse 14 if you fear the lord and serve him and obey him and not rebel then you'll end up following the lord here's my question for you now you decide this the rest of the message do you want your life to go in the direction that you keep serving god or do you want to just flounder around and do whatever you want and you don't care what happens? You decide. Don't tell me out loud. You decide. You decide tonight. And by the way, you have no choice because I've already brought it up to you and you must decide. It's like when somebody receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, they don't have a choice of receiving him or doing nothing. If you don't receive him, then you do reject him. And if you don't decide tonight that you want your life to count and you don't want to end up having a vain life when you get to the end, you have to decide that and you're going to decide one way or the other, at least for now, tonight. Your life's either going to be vain, going to be a mess, nobody's going to care, you're not going to count for God, or you're going to decide that your life's important and God made something for you to do and he'll give you the power to do it if you will. Fear the Lord, serve him, and obey his voice, and rebel not against him. The Bible says if you do that, you won't leave him. Now, the people you know that left him, do you want to be those people? Next time somebody preaches, do you want them to think about you? That you used to serve God, but now you don't anymore? Let me give you some things quickly. The Bible says there in verse 21, just, just mark that one. If you go back to that. He turned not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit. May I say to you tonight, first of all, vain things do not profit. There is no profitability to vain things. I need somebody to read a couple of scriptures. Can I have a volunteer? Brother Bello, thank you. I saw your hand first. Brother Bello, could you read for me 2 Timothy 3, verse 4? Brother Bello didn't raise his hand. I was, I was just kidding. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 4. Whenever you get it, stand up and read it for me, please. Jonathan, can you look up Mark 8, 34? I'm ready. 2 Timothy 3. Any high-minded love of the pleasures more than loving of God. 2 Timothy 3, 4. Thank you. What's your testimony? Do you love pleasures more than God? 
You love God more than pleasures. Jonathan, please, Mark 8, 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Thank you. Here's something I want everybody to understand tonight. When you get saved, you're born again in the kingdom of God. You're part of God's family. You're always going to be in that family. But you then decide how you are going to live as you grow up in that family. You decide if you are going to obey your parent, your heavenly father. You decide if you're going to do right. You decide if you're going to have a good testimony. You decide if you're going to obey God and make people proud of your father because he's proud of you or not. You decide that. And first of all, I want you to know tonight things that will keep you, things you can do to keep from turning to the vain things. Watch out for the personal pleasure. Young people who stray from church and the Lord are usually doing this, seeking personal pleasure. Well, I always wanted to do that. I can't wait till I get out of this Christian school so I can do this and that. Well, you know, you are not trying to serve God when you have that attitude. You also don't have that attitude, even a good church like this one, or those that are visiting tonight, and you say, I can't wait to get out from under that pastor. I can't wait to get out from under that church. It doesn't have anything to do with the pastor or the church. It has to do that you were born into the family of God. Amen. And you have things to do that are important, that are worth something. 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. There is no personal pleasure that can hold a candle to contentment. Tell you one of the greatest things in your life when you decide that you'll be happy with whatever God gives you wherever it is. Do you know that's what most of the entire world, all of the 247 countries, that's what most of them are doing. They're trying to get more things. They're trying to get more property. They're trying to have more possessions. But I want you to know something. Those possessions will never bring you contentment. But serving your heavenly father and doing what he wants you to do, that will give you contentment. Which do you like better? What do you think depression and discouragement and all that is? And I've, I've thought about that here some. It's a real thing. You know where most of it comes from? Not being happy with what you have. Not being happy. Not being content with how somebody treated you or the words somebody said to you. Or somebody looked at you funny or somebody didn't look at you the right way. Or somebody didn't say hi to you. Or somebody forgot your birthday. On and on and on it goes. And we're not content with how people treat you. Let me tell you something. People are people. Just like you. <laughs> We're all people. We're human. We forget things. We're not perfect. In our flesh dwelleth no good thing. So for crying out loud, why would you let your contentment be based on somebody else like you? <laughs> why would you? No reason. Not only the personal pleasure would keep you from following God, but secondly, peer popularity. John 12, 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. It is not uncommon for a young Christian to turn aside from following the Lord when he or she seeks approval from his or her peers. Doesn't matter what age you are. Doesn't matter if you're in kindergarten and you're grumping about somebody else because the teacher ogled over them more about something you, that they drew than you drew. It doesn't matter if you're 40 and somebody else got a new car and you got a newer car. So they went and got one that was six months newer than yours. The model 2018 and a half. Wow. It doesn't matter what age you are. You worry about peer pressure. One of our former presidents wrote a book. It's a booklet. You could find it on the Internet. It's called When a Man Comes to Himself. Calvin Coolidge. It's this big. Is that thick? And you know what the point of the whole thing is? At some point in your life, you're going to realize that you are not your own. You are bought with a price. There is something that God made you to do. You need to find out what it is and do it. Amen. And quit worrying about your own dreams and desires. Well, I believe in dreams. Yeah, so do I. The dreams of what God wants you to do. The dreams of how you can please God with your life. Well, I want to be the richest man in South Carolina. Not a God dream. Sorry, it's not a God dream. There's nowhere in the Bible. Well, I'll use a lot of it for God. Not a God dream. If you make that dream, then you're not going to have any time to go knock any doors or invite your neighbors to church or help when there's a work day, et cetera, et cetera. Do I need to keep going? Uh, can I get a witness? Anybody here? Yeah, yeah, he's first. We're supposed to be last. He's number one. Don't worry about the peer pressure in your life. It makes you seek after vain things. When popularity among your peers is more important to you than approval from God, you will turn aside from following the Lord. 
If you make, the, you know what, you, listen, you know what the things are that you and I do in our lives? The things that are most important to us. I'm going to give you a very human, quick, personal illustration. <clears throat> I've had many things to do this week. People from several different countries, guy from Nigeria that's home on deputation, trying to get a hold of me, needs some advice, needs some do things. The guy that's going to Morocco, the guy that was in Morocco, is on his way to Tunisia, it's in Tunisia now. Besides lots of things going on, lots of things with my family. All of my family lives here now. My parents, I know they don't look like it, but they're 77, 78 years old for crying out loud. They're almost dead. I mean, they're old. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They act like they're 55 or so. Which is what I am, and I feel like I'm dead sometimes. Anyway, I got my parents, then I got all of my children live here, my one son, Jonathan, and my lovely daughter-in-law's here, the, the, my grandbaby mama of my three grandchildren. She's here in the nursery right now, isn't she? She's here tonight. And um, wonderful lady. And then my grandchildren. Joy. Hi. How are you? My oldest grandchild, sweet and precious. Make sure you never, never hurt her or do wrong to her. And uh, then my other two grandchildren are here. So I've got quite a, a balance. Plus there's seven churches within 30 minutes from where I'm standing that I've preached for, most of them more than once. And they're dear pastors and dear friends. And I want to see them. Some of them want to see me. I want to be there for service, visit them, so forth. Lots of other things going on in my life and all the families and everything. And I had a priority. There was one person that I told my family, <clears throat> and I changed a couple things, and I said, I have to meet with that pastor, no matter what, hell or high water, I have to meet him. Do you know who that was? He's Pastor Bellow. He's sitting right back there. And I met with him this week. Was it Thursday, brother? met with Brother Bello. He, he was at a church 30, 40 minutes from here. He's a pastor. He's been in this area for many years. He's a great pastor, a great man of God. His wife almost went to heaven several years ago. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Trying, stressing time with brain tumor and surgery and cancer and other things on top of that. And he's faithfully taking care of her. Very good people. And he's been at a church. None of you know the story about, but they did wrong to him. Some, some bad people in a good church where he'd been several years. I'm just being honest with you. They, a couple of the people there made a very serious evil mistake and really hurt him several weeks ago. So I just decided he's priority, tight week, I'm going to see him. We do the things that are most important to us. If you decide to make it most important in your life to serve God, then you will keep doing it. If it's the most important thing in your life, the peer pressure will not keep you from it. A companion of fools shall be destroyed, the Bible says in 1320. You know what most of your companions are going to do? Make you a fool. Because you're going to become what they are. Amen? What happens with a steel ball and it's hot and one that's cold? You put them next to each other. What happens? The hot one gets cold. Sick person, well person. Put them in the same room. What happens? Does a sick person get well? No. The well person gets sick. Have somebody that's a foolish person, and you're trying to walk with God, you hang around with them, what happens to you? You become a foolish person. Beware of the fools, the Bible says. A companion of them shall be destroyed. Third thing, persuasive professors. Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know what beware mean? That's a warning. Beware. Watch out. Keep your eyes open. Look out. Beware lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Can I tell you what the tradition of men is worth in the economy of God? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. The tradition of man. And yet all the time we, we find ourselves tempted and falling for tradition of man instead of following what God says. And I'm telling you today, if you would quit thinking and caring about what people think about you and in letting somebody teach you things that are unbiblical, why in the world would you get some goofball on the radio or some wackadoo on TV and let him talk to you and all this goofy stuff that tickles your ears that is not scriptural? You are going to get off track. 
Beware lest any man spoil you. When you start following a philosophy or a professor or a teacher, or another preacher, anyone who is opposed to the truth, whom you believe to be smarter than the Bible and your pastor, you're going to wind up turning aside from the Lord. Look, God gives you a good pastor. He studies the word of God, teaches you and preaches you straight truth. I'm going to say that no matter how many times it takes until you properly respond. God gives you a pastor who is a student of the word of God, who studies and preaches and gives you things that are biblically correct to help you. Amen. So why would you miss hearing them? It's a little side road, but the Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Why would you decide casually to miss some of the services and not hear the preaching that could keep you from becoming vain? Amen. Do you want your life to count for Christ? Do you want it to be worthy when you get to the end? Do you want it to be worthy now? Do you want it to count now? Stay away from the teachers that are not giving you the truth. Last thing, not only the peer popularity, the personal pleasure that's keeping you away from being not vain, but the persuasive professors, and lastly, the passing pursuits. 1 John 2, 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but the word of God stands forever. That's one of the reasons why I'm a crazy man, why I go in debt, why I don't have a new car. I've never had a new car in my life, not one time. I really don't care. I'm not just saying this, you know, eh. I'm telling you right now, if you gave me a new car after church, I would sell it and use part of the money to take a mission trip and buy Bibles and buy a cheaper car. Oh, you say that, but you wouldn't do that. I'm telling you. Let me put it this way. Try me. I would. Why? Because I want my life to count. I don't want it to waste. I don't want it to get it to end. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. Proverbs 8, 10 and 11. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. How much plainer can the word of God be? Well, I want to have lots of money when I die. Okay, you are being vain. You are not following God. Your life is not going to count like it could have. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not compared to it. It is not uncommon for Christians to pursue worldly success and wealth and to forsake the durable riches, riches Proverbs 8, 18 talks about. You know what durable means? Last forever. You like to buy something? What about these people that you buy something in the store and say, would you like to uh, cover my extended warranty? What's the warranty that comes with it? Uh, a year. <laughs> it's only going to last a year. Uh, yeah, and uh, now it's six months. Would you like to extend your warranty? No, I want you to take it back. Give me my money. I don't want something that's pre-planned to last six months. Cell phones are the worst. They make them to last between six months and a year because they're going to come out with a different one. That's truth from a guy that manages the cell phone store told me. My parents got air conditioning a year ago. Oops, I'm sorry. A year and a couple months, excuse me, a couple weeks ago. Whole thing from 40 years or so. I mean, the thing just uh, leaked and water through the roof. Had to do all kinds of junk in their house a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. It's uh, two weeks after the year warranty. You'll have to pay for our service call. You'll have to pay for what we do. That happened this week at 2558 Vestavia Road, my parents. I had to keep my dad off the guy. He wanted to beat him up. No, I'm just kidding. You have no choice. Why? Things are not durable. You know what is durable? This. You know what is durable? Distributing this. You know what is durable? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what is durable? Sharing that with somebody else. You know what else is durable? The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor, there is profit. Every minute, every dime you spend on discipling a new Christian is durable. Well, what if they don't listen to me? What's that got to do with anything? You're serving God, not that person. You work for God, amen? You don't want your life to be vain. I'm almost done. I'm skipping something quickly. When you place more value on the accumulation of money and possessions than you do on instruction, wisdom, and knowledge of God's word, you will turn aside from following the Lord. If you put more into that, why would you keep serving the Lord if you're spending your time on the other stuff? Put more value on the accumulation of money and possessions than you do on the instruction, 
wisdom and knowledge of God's words, you will turn aside from following the Lord. These are four of the most common vain things that cause a person to, stop, to turn aside from following the Lord. Can I ask you a question? The Bible says, follow the Lord and turn ye not aside. It's a vain thing. Moreover, verse 23 where I started, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. This is Samuel talking to God's chosen people. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Now Samuel turns around. Of course, I know it's forever, O Lord, the word of God settled before the foundation of the world. This is not written. doesn't mean this is Samuel's opinion. God wrote this a long time. Then he made Samuel and made Samuel say what he wanted him to say. It's the word of God. That's how powerful it is. God forbid that I should sin against any, excuse me, against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he had done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king, their new king Saul. Here's my, my last closing conclusion. Everything that I'm talking about is up to you alone right now this minute well if somebody would just show me how fooey on you you don't blame it on somebody else well if somebody if somebody would teach me no no you have a bible you have the holy spirit you don't gripe it on somebody well my mother didn't do this for me my dad didn't do this for me. the people in the church hurt me uh, the neighbor didn't look at me Some, somebody you know messed up my fruit mashed her thumb in it when i bought it at the store <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your favorite hymn is the hee-haw hymn, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Get out of that stuff. Look, you're a child of Jesus Christ. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're a son of God. You're a son of the king. You're going to heaven forever. You have a place that's prepared for you, and God is still working on it. You don't have a lot of reason to gripe and complain. You need to decide to not let your life be in vain. Do what God wants you to do with it. Would you bow your heads, please? A vain life is a wasted life. Vain decisions are wasted decisions. Turn not to the vain things. I met people in Israel, call themselves religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, and they have so many stupid rules and laws. And even if they do all of that, you ask the rabbi, am I going to heaven when I die? No way anybody give you that guarantee. Well, you just have to try hard. Well, how hard do I have to try? They have to give money. How much money do I have to give? On and on. And I went to help and minister with the Israeli national softball team. They came to Michigan two years ago. And I got to meet with them and witness to them and encourage them. A few of the young men that played were in synagogues. They were religious Jews. One of the rabbis wrote a special letter and gave permission for his kid to wear cleats to play softball in the world championships on Shabbat, the Sabbath. The other rabbi down the road said his teenager from his synagogue was not allowed to wear cleats if he did, he was going to die and go to hell. I saw the letters. Do you ever spend just a couple moments thanking God that you don't have to live a vain life like that? God tells you exactly what you need to know. He tells you he'll do all the work to take you to heaven. You just have to receive him and let him. Then he gives you the opportunity to decide to serve him so you can earn rewards for him, so you can have some crowns to cast at his feet one day because of everything he does for us. For crying out loud, he lets you call upon him and he'll answer you and show you great and mighty things. He takes care of you. He promises you the righteous will not be seen begging bread. On and on and on. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God shall supply all your riches according to heaven. What, 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 what else do you want? You and I need to decide to live a life that is not lived in vain, that is lived for Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. I wonder if there's anybody tonight, you say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. I'm not 100% sure that if I died, I am going to heaven. 
Maybe everybody thinks you are. I don't really care who thinks you are, you think you are. But in reality, between you and God, you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven if you died tonight. You'd like me to pray for you. Would you raise your hand, please? Thank you. Anybody else? Say, preacher, please pray for me. I'm not 100% sure if I died, I'm going to heaven. Anybody else? I won't embarrass you or call you out. Is there anybody tonight you say, preacher, I want you to pray for me? Very simply, I am saying this, and this is my prayer tonight. I do not want my life to be in vain. Would you raise your hand, please? God bless you. Amen. I do not want my life to be in vain. Anybody else? Thank you. Preacher, please pray for me that I will serve God. Stay on the right track. Anyone else? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless these folks tonight that have raised their hand. Or there's at least one person I've seen, not sure they're on their way to heaven. There may be more that just didn't raise their hand. Lord, I pray that you would help them realize that we're all sinners and we deserve to die and go to hell. That's what we deserve. That's what we've earned. But Lord, help them also realize the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if we will call upon the name of Jesus and ask Him to save us sincerely in our heart, make the decision to call upon Him that He has promised He would save us and take us to heaven. Please help them realize that and trust you as their Savior tonight if it's in their heart to do so. I pray, Lord, for the many hands that looked like almost every hand asking, Lord, for you to help their lives not to be vain. And my hand is also in that. Lord, I want my life to count. I don't want it to be vain. I'm going to do everything I can. I want to help everybody, every church, every pastor, every missionary, get scripture in everybody's hand, get the gospel to them. Lord, please, I've been, I've been doing it a long time. I don't want to change now. I don't want my life to be vain. I pray that you'll answer the request of everybody else in here tonight. Or there may be a decision somebody needs to make, something they need to get out of their life. Maybe they need to quit worrying about some peer pressure. Maybe they need to quit worrying about some things in their life, some things that don't matter. Whatever it is, Lord, I know your Holy Spirit is very capable to bring it to their mind. And I pray that you'll help them make decisions accordingly tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes closed. Would you all stand for me for just a moment, please? Make it easier for folks to get out of their seats. And we'll have the piano play. If the Lord's spoken to you, if you raised your hand, would you come pray?